Okay, can you take your seats, please? Well, Dr. Segi said to me the other night, he said, one of the ways to keep people to keep people awake is to say something dramatic. <laughs> That's what he said. And he was making reference to a certain sport. He said, say something like your team lost 5-0 and they'll stay awake the whole night. <laughs> Well, some of you don't know about sports, so I won't try to crack a joke on that one. <laughs> well, this school has been very different, very different, even though it's quite intensive. It's, uh, it's provoking the mind of the spirit to be stretched uh, in understanding things that sometimes the mind of the soul is resistant um, uh, to. And, um, and obviously, when the mind of the spirit is brought back to its rightful place in how we view things, and I've, Dr. Sam, when he was giving us the definition of the heavenly man and the, the man who functions from the soul, explain some of that to us, but uh, the mind of the spirit, when that comes to the right place, I think reason from a heavenly perspective will become normal. Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing how when you try to work things out rationally, intellectually, cognitively, dialectically, comparatively, or whatever way, how there's so many conflicts that takes place with one spirit, but um, God is in this school, obviously, you know, strengthening certain positions so that when we leave here, we are not going to be operating on old hard drives, but we're going to move into, you know, new platforms, new, we're going to use new spiritual hardware to carry the fresh downloads from the cloud of His glory. Amen? Man, are you ready for that? So you have to, please, you have to, one of the things that the Bible teaches us over and over again is to renew the mind. And we have to do it all the time. And the renewal of the mind is very, very tough. But, you know, I, I would like to recommend to you that you don't, don't spend all your time writing. You learn to listen with the Spirit because there are certain things that only the finger of God can write into the tablets of your heart. And you can write into your brain a lot of things, but some stuff has to be captured by the Spirit. If it doesn't hit you at the spot, you'll never get it. You can have volumes of notes, but you'll never get it. Would you train yourself to listen? And when something hits you, then write it down. If you feel you want to capture it the way it's being said, it's important. And obviously, then you go from here, take the recordings, and then you can make your notes and reflect because some great things are being said and, and they could just go over our heads because we are concentrating so much with the soul that the spirit is being neglected in registering the things that should be. So train yourself. Say to your neighbor, poise yourself. Poise yourself, okay? Incline yourself. Incline yourself. You have to learn how to recline on his bosom. So position yourselves to the things that's happening. And I'm sensing now, you know, the first few days, there's been great warfare in the atmosphere. But I'm sensing now that the cloud um, is opening and light is coming through what was once perceived to be a dark cloud. There's a piercing. There's an opening that's taking place. I sense it in the spirit. And uh, so be open to the offloads, the downloads of what God wants. And I sense also, you know, I'm the adjudicator of the school under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, obviously, and I train myself. 
I train myself to hear uh, and to not just say things. But I'm sensing that the next phase of the school now will shift to impartation. Okay, there will always be information because this is how we're all armored, all wired. But don't focus on the information as much as impartation is carried on the back of revelation. Okay, but focus now on impartation because God has to, he has to um, not just, he's installed it, it's in your spirits, but it has to now be firmly established. There's an arrangement that's going to take place with some tweaking, some adjusting, maybe a chiropractic adjustment, you know, um, some massaging here and there. Some of you need that right now, I can see that, and uh, God will do all of that. Uh, but it's my privilege this morning to welcome for the first time to the podium somebody who's becoming a voice that is well known in this country and emerging as a father. And I'd like to also now use these platforms to introduce such voices. And no stranger to us, you've heard him in our ALSs, you hear him here today for the first time in the school. That's Ralph Elia, Elia uh, son of Dr. Sergi, and I've asked him to come and share the word of the Lord with us. Well, good afternoon, family. Good to see all of you again this afternoon. If you're wondering why my shirt is out of my pants, it's not apostolic. And it's also not because I don't have a belt. I noticed uh, Dr. Sam was getting a bit rebellious with his dressing, so I decided to join him. <laughs> <clears throat> I believe in America they call it trashing. Uh, yesterday I introduced some thoughts in the invocation about um, sons that are heirs of the kingdom, uh, but before I do that, uh, one of the things that, that, that we can sense in the context of this apostolic season, and for some of us that may be in the school for, for the first time and are uh, maybe being introduced to some of the, uh, the truths that God has been unveiling for many, many years now, maybe you're also in a period of transition. Uh, but <clears throat> season comes to a confluence, it comes to a high point, and you will sense certain frustrations uh, that come upon you uh, when God wants to do something fresh, even within the season that we all know. Because uh, when you study the movements of God, the study seasons of God, uh, they can become your greatest cage. They can become... Uh, like, like many movements of God have become denominations, like the faith movement, uh, like prophetic movements that have become uh, denominations, and they actually become places that end up caging those that had heard and perceived the sound initially, but did not continue to move on with what God is saying and doing. Amen? So uh, do you know that even within this kairos, it's very easy to become caged in your thinking. And part of what we are hearing uh, with many of the thoughts that has been shared from all the speakers is uh, something fresh in the way in which we are operating. And I would like to bring some practical truths to that so that uh, we can begin to see ourselves uh, evolve into something, into something new and something that I feel that God is really beginning to, to unlock. Now, Many of us are used to the concept of households. And uh, I would uh, advise you if you, uh, you know, if you are here for the first time, you can go back and get the teachings on the households of faith, uh, which have been extensively uh, drawn out, the father and son wineskin, uh, the development of your local church from, from a membership model into a sonship model, uh, and many, many other truths like that that we have seen uh, being doctrinally labored through for many sessions. And while that uh, brings us to an understanding of how church needs to, be, needs to be configured as a family, and we become part of a, as Dr. Segi mentioned yesterday, a homogeneous unit, 
But do you know it, it can become the very thing that limits you. It can become the very thing that cages the way you think. I know some of you are getting upset with me now, but it's okay. I'll, I'll explain what I'm saying shortly. Now, by way of experience, a few months ago, uh, Dr. Segi sent me to another area. And uh, together with his wife, they prayed for us and sent us to another area, which is just about 20 kilometers from where I, I'm currently operating. And when we went into this new environment, um, I, had to, I had to now engage with the counselors of this environment. I have to learn farming techniques. I never knew farming was such a science. Um, there were many, many other things that I had to begin to deal with. I had to start dealing with building contractors, learning about the building industry, and many, many other things. But he didn't know that uh, about six months before that, I started to sense an immense frustration in my own journey that I felt that I was in an apostolic pool going around and around and around. Somebody help me. And you've got to get to that point where you get frustrated. And so when he laid his hands on me and sent me to this new, to this new place, uh, I began to experience something fresh in my own life because I was faced with a challenge. And uh, the community that we are dealing with right now where we are placed, we are surrounded by poverty. And the, the church is in the midst of this, this environment that is just surrounded by, by poverty. And the Lord gave us a specific word when we went in there. But the reason I'm telling you all of this is because uh, I've been teaching and training and equipping people even within our own family circles in terms of the concepts of household and how to be a good son in the household. And myself being a son to a spiritual father within the context of the ABC family, and being a faithful son over the years, but you must understand that it can become limited in your reach, it can become limited in what God has really planned for you if we don't begin to, to experience something greater. So this school, as Thomas mentioned, is, is here to commission you into something bigger, something uh, more than what you have already experienced. So I just want to share some introductory thoughts about how sons of the households begin to express the father in the realm of the kingdom. And how while you are a son in the house, you are actually here to dispense the grace of the father in the world. Amen? So because your, your mentality around household is so streamlined, it can become something that limits you. And, and I'd like to to just delve into that a little more. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, He has del delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So we are conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And the reason that Jesus came primarily was to express to everyone around Him the one in whom He is in and the one who is in Him, and that is the Father. So Jesus lived as the son on the earth to simply point people to the father because he is the way to the father. Amen? So everything he did, the way in which he expressed himself, the way in which he spoke, the way in which he tackled situations, the way in which he handled things was simply to reveal a higher order of the heavenly father which he came to express and to reveal to everyone around him. Now, Jesus as the, as the perfect son, as the, the perfect one, as the, the mature son, is showing us that even we who are sons of God, our intent on this earth is to reveal that dimension because this world is in a state of being orphans. And therefore, your assignment on this earth to the world is to reveal the love of the Father to them. Now, what is the purpose of the household, as Tamo mentioned? It is the process of formation. But your, your assignment in the kingdom of God is to function. Is to function. So, for us, while you limit yourself to a household, you think that serving the household is a function in the kingdom of God. But it becomes your greatest limitation. We all together? Okay? So, um... In Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, 
Here's Jesus uh, speaking in parables to the multitudes. And uh, as he's relating the parables, the Bible will tell you that he went out, uh, he went out of the house and sat by the sea. So, how many of you know there's two locations? There's a house and there's the sea. Everyone say the sea. I come from the city where there's a sea. And uh, whenever you leave the house, uh, you are going out to meet people that are regarded as part of the multitudes. And many times, because you are so housebound, you never enjoy the sea. <laughs> and the sea is also the nations. So, Jesus was, uh, was, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And a great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into the boat and he sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And as you know, he began to speak many mysteries to them which were in parables. And as he began to share these parables, uh, he said, Behold a soul, went out a soul, etc. And as he begins to speak to these parables, speak these parables, the disciples came to him and they, they began to ask him to explain these parables. And so when you read Matthew chapter 13 verse 36, he sends the multitudes away and he goes into the house and his disciples came saying, explain to us the, the parable of the tares and the fields. So the house is a place of the unveiling of the mysteries. And it's not to everyone. It's to a select company of people. It's just to those who would, we would regard as his sons. They were his disciples. And he would bring them into the house. He would explain the mysteries of these parables. And uh, later on, when the parable of the wheat and the tares is being explained, you will find that in verse 38, that he talks about, in verse number, in verse number 38 of Matthew chapter 13, it will tell you that when he explained to them the parable of the wheat and the tares, you find that the, the world is the field, and the seed is the sons of the kingdom. And the seed is sown into the world. Amen? Now, the seed originally in the first chapter, the seed is the word of God. Is that right? But now the seed has become the sons of the kingdom. And they are sown into the world. But they are trained in the house. Are we all getting it? Now, when you read Matthew chapter 13 about the seed that is sown, and he begins to explain the parable of the sower, understand that the seed is is sown and it falls on different types of ground and it tells you that you will, you will experience that when the seed falls on different types of ground, you would experience tribulation and persecution, etc. And it tells you why. It tells you because of the word of the kingdom. Amen? Do you know some of us are suffering for nothing? You should suffer for the right thing. Yeah, he said you will experience tribulation, persecution, etc. because of the word of the kingdom. So, the sons who are hearing the word and eventually become the word must be sown into the world. And into the world, they will not become sons of the household, but they will become sons of the kingdom of God. This is what I feel is really going to be a major shift that is going to take place in us. So as you begin to go back, you need to begin to think of how you need to reform the minds of your sons, not to just think in the context of household, but to think about the influence they need to start having for the purposes of the kingdom to advance, and it is in the world. Amen? Okay, now, uh, we, need, we need some biblical, you know, some biblical foundation for this. And... Uh, to see this transition from the son of the household, and I'll put it this way, to you actually being a father in the kingdom. Because you can father people in the kingdom. Yes, when you come to the household, there is an elder and there is a father. One that you would submit to yourself to as, as a son within the house. You'll submit to the doctrine of your father. You'll submit... Uh, to the culture that is within the house, etc. But when you are sown into the world as a son of the kingdom, you can father people in the kingdom. So the son in the household can be a father in the kingdom. Say amen. 
So let's look at this. Here's Joseph, who is the son of, of Jacob, as we all know, and he's in the house of Jacob. And while he is the son in the house, there were certain developments. And while you are a son in the house, there are certain things that you will get and certain things that you will go through. So while he is in the house, he receives a coat of many colors. But he's a son of jo Jacob. He is functioning in the context of a house. In that house, he receives this coat of many colors. And how many of you know he's beginning to receive his mantle? He's beginning to receive an understanding of how he is configured. He begins to receive an understanding of the grace dimension that he carries. He's beginning to receive an understanding of the anointing that is upon his life. You might also call it the calling that is upon you. You begin to discover that within the household. Now, when you discover that within the household, your perception is that it's only for the household. And so you begin to function with that kind of mindset. Amen? How many of you know you've been talking to the same people for too long? <laughs> so if everyone is congratulating you and telling you how good you are, you're going to believe it sometime. Until you meet someone else. Until you talk to some new people. Are we together? So if someone in your household told you you're a prophet, you might just be believing that for quite, some, quite a long time. Until someone tells you you're actually a false prophet. <laughs> you see, the son of the kingdom is functioning from Christ. <laughs> that means in the world you can become an apostle. Because apostles bring alignment. So when you're talking to people in the world, they need alignment. In the world you can speak as a prophet. That means you can have the word of knowledge for someone and just speak to them like that. In the world, you can be a teacher. In the world, you can be a pastor. So many people in the world are depressed. They need some encouragement. Because in the world, you are functioning from the head who is Christ himself. Amen? Yes, when you come into the household, you may submit, you may serve, you function in a specific order, you might have a specific duty, etc and you would submit to that but the moment you are commissioned out of that house and you go into the world i want you to know the grace of father can just function through you like that it starts to pour like a river amen but because you believe that all that is just for church and all that is just limited to that and so you're a great musician and you're a great singer in the church and you believe you're mariah carey in the church until you go out into the world. So, Joseph receives his mantle, his coat of many colors in the house. And do you know in the house you can show off your coat of many colors. And everyone would enjoy your coat of many colors and tell you how wonderful your coat of many colors. Lies, they all despise your coat of many colors. <laughs> no one will appreciate your coat of many colors. So, he had to deal with the hatred and the envy of his brothers. So, do you know, household just limits you to domestic issues. And so your, your entire fight is about, is about the coat of many colors. And everyone hates Joseph while he's in this house as he's wearing this coat of many colors. You see, in the house you dream. <laughs> this is your dream. Your dream is, I want to be like Bradley <laughs> while you're there. Your dream is, I want to be like Pastor Tamil. Or I want to be like Sam and I want to be in the heavens. Well, I just brought you down to earth now. <laughs> this is the reality of church. Amen? And so in the, in the house, your whole dreaming is just about stuff in the house. Uh, and that dream is actually not a dream, it's called ambition. It's just an ambitious spirit of wanting to be something within the house. But yes, Joseph, he had dreams, and we all know his dreams are very prophetic in terms of uh, how he saw his brothers bowing down before him, his father and his mother, as his father interpreted the dream in terms of the sun, the moon, and the stars. We're not, we won't get into all of that. 
And uh, because you are in the house, do you know that you share your dreams in immaturity? Thinking that everyone would celebrate your dreams. And so often many of you are dreaming, some of you have prophetic words, and uh, you have impressions, you have visions. And so in the household you share them often, not realizing that in immaturity you are actually offending other people. You are actually causing some harm and damage. You can bring some division in, inside the house because you, uh, you believe that your dreams are better than everyone else's dreams. But in the house, you're just a dreamer. <laughs> Amen? And dreaming is good because it simply means you're sleeping a lot. <laughs> so, I have to keep saying these things because this is the last session. I have to keep you away. <laughs> now, so dreams, you share your dreams in, in immaturity. And Joseph is a good son. He follows the instruction of his father. You all agree? He's a good son. He's, he's submitted to his father. Whenever his father sent him out to go and check on his brothers, he would, he would do that. And whatever his father asked him to do, he would do. So as a son in the house, it is important to be submissive to the father of the house. It's important to be submissive to the one that God has appointed to follow his instructions. And Joseph did that. And so as you, as you have constructed households, you have people that are submissive to the father. They are, they are following the instructions of the father to the point of where they don't hear God anymore. And yes, while God speaks to us through fathers. Listen, I speak to you as a father myself. We have a family of churches, and I understand this concept. And to the point of where you, you, can, you can become the only voice, where our duty is as fathers is to train people to hear the voice of God for themselves. But you, are, you, know, you become so submissive that you, to decide whether you want to buy a white BMW or a red BMW, you have to phone your father. Listen, it's a BMW. We all together? But, you know, he's a good son. He's, uh, he's a faithful son. He's in the household and he's, he's reporting to his father. And do you know, while he's in the house, he reports to his father about his brothers. <laughs> Sons in the household are good at reporting about their brother. Whose report will you believe? And so they, they have a, you know, they have this relationship with the father. And listen, the story about the prodigal is that you can have a relationship with the father, but not fellowship with your brother. And so often many uh, within the household feel that they have to, to be people who are spies, report everything that is taking place in the house, because you want to gain the favor of your father. And uh, in, inevitably, they're not realizing that they're causing so much damage within the house because they have no relationships with your brother. If you see your brother doing something wrong, the Bible says, go to your brother. Go to your brother. Don't go to your father and complain. To him. Go to your brother. In a mature house, you can do that. In a mature house, you can do that. So yes, Joseph in the household, he reported to his father about his brothers. Do you know he took care of his father's sheep? He looked for his brothers of the household. Later on, he went out looking for them. But he was betrayed by his brothers. And uh, you see, while you are in the household and you having this good homogeneous unit, everything is going well. The people are tithing. The people are faithful. You got a, you know, you got a deep commitment. And if you're building like this for 10 years, you can build something like that. That's comfortable and it's good. But crisis must come. If you're going to shift to new levels, you've you got to have some crisis. There's nothing better than crisis that can shift your household to new levels. Nothing better than crisis. And so, when Joseph went to meet his brothers and he was betrayed, do you know his crisis delivered him into his destiny? What he was really meant for. Amen? So the very betrayal that you sometimes experience in your household is to deliver, to deliver you into your crisis. Let me say something to you. The early church 
was a very good homogeneous unit because they were all Jews. <laughs> Did you think about that? You could, uh, you would sell your land, you would sell your possessions because you needed to take care of a fellow Jew. So the homogeneous unit was so good. It was so comfortable. They were fellowshipping every day. They had the culture right. Doctrine, fellowship, baking of bread, prayers, all good. But we were all Jews. If you put a couple of Gentiles there, it might have been different. <laughs> there was a solid, homogeneous unit. So why do you think God allowed persecution? Because the homogeneous unit was getting so good, they were not doing what they were supposed to do. That you started out in Jerusalem, and then you had to start moving out. So God allowed the persecution to come in so that they could go and get the job done. So if you're wondering why your household is going through some stuff, and maybe there's a couple of, of uh, Assyrians in your house and a few Absaloms that have risen up and a couple of Jezebels that are there, ah, don't worry about it. It's all part of the game because you're building something so comfortable. Amen? Amen? That's why I travel every month because I have to get away from everything. <laughs> I just go there. Wherever I go, I don't even have to pray or read my Bible. Anything I say, the people believe it. <laughs> but I'll tell you, in my own household, I have to pray more, fast more, because they know everything. Hmm? They know everything. So, here's the shift now. The son is in the household and there's a major shift that takes place. You get it? He's now in Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, he ends up in Potiphar's house as you know. But the household has trained him with a lot of things. He got his mantle. He has his dreams. He's under the instruction of his father. He learns to deal with brothers at 18. He goes through all of that. And do you know Joseph's character was processed. By going through all of that, he, he, had, he learned patience. He learned self-control. He learned so many things. Where did he learn it? He learned it in the household. And now he's in Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, he's appointed into the house of Potiphar. And when he's in the house of Potiphar, he managed the house of Potiphar with excellence. But he was trained in a household. So when you get into the world as a son of the kingdom... Do you know your office space and whatever you are managing, if you have a position of authority, etc., it should be of the highest level of excellence because whatever you are trained for in the household is manifesting as one who is a son of the kingdom. So when he goes into the house of Potiphar, favor comes into Potiphar's house. That everything he does in the house of Potiphar experiences tremendous grace. And even Potiphar is overwhelmed with, with what takes place. And while he's there, you know, he experiences temptation. In terms of Potiphar's wife who made advances towards him, etc. And uh, he was able to overcome the temptation. He was able to deal with the temptation. And he said, I cannot do this thing because it would be a sin against God. But he had to be trained somewhere to know that. He had to be developed. He had to deal with the works of the flesh, as it were. But in his father's house, he would have been receiving enough doctrine. He would have been receiving enough, enough instruction. He would have been receiving the word that would have been equipping him and training him so that when he's placed in an environment where he's now faced with sexual temptation, he is able to overcome. Now, he gets falsely accused, as we all know, and he's thrown into prison. But you see, he's not dreaming anymore. He's interpreting dreams. See, if you're in the house, you'll just dream. <laughs> but when you are pushed out of the house, and you are into the dynamics of the kingdom of God, you don't dream, you interpret dreams. You are able to interpret situations. You are able to discern the times. You are able to see things from the perspective of God. You are able to bring light to stuff that other people can't understand and see. Simply because you are someone who has been crafted in a household to function as the son of the kingdom. So when you get into that environment, 
You're not the dreamer anymore. You're interpreting the dreams. Amen? He saw the fulfillment of, the, of his interpretation of the dreams. He made all the dreams come true by governing Egypt. He stood before Pharaoh and managed his affairs. And here's it. He became a father to Pharaoh. Amen? That's in Genesis 45 verse 8. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house. Listen to this. And ruler throughout all of the land of Egypt. So, fathering, fathering was on a personal level with Pharaoh. Amen? This was to give advice. It was to give wisdom. It was to give counsel. And we know that Pharaoh is the title for king. So, fathering seeks into the deep recesses of individuals' heart beyond their title and beyond their capacity, beyond who they are in the world. So while Pharaoh was king, Joseph could get into the deep recesses of his heart beyond his capacity as king to talk to him because deep calls to deep. So when he's talking to him as one who is now a son of the kingdom is fathering someone from the deep recesses. He's speaking into someone beyond the capacity of his title as king. So when you're talking to a CEO, you're not talking to someone who's just the CEO of whatever company. You're speaking to the heart of the person. Amen? This is what the son of the kingdom is able to get into. He's able to speak to the heart of the matter. So it's beyond, the person now forgets that he's a CEO. And he starts eating food with his fingers with you. Because you, you come down to the reality of who he is. Everything else is a show. Everything is an image. Everything else is made up. By now you should all know that. Everything else is just to impress. Because that's what this world trains you to do. The spirit of this age is to maintain the image. And everything that goes with it. But when you come in as a son of the kingdom, carrying grace, you are able to father people on a personal level. Amen? You are able to deliver something into them because you are now not just the son of the household talking about the 13 laws of what you should not do. You are now a father that can reach people within the world. And from that dynamic, you are functioning by expressing the kingdom of God that is inside of you. Hello? Second thing he said, as he was talking to his brothers, firstly he said, God, he has made me a father to Pharaoh. Second, he has made me Lord of all his house. Lord means to control, to manage, to supervise, give oversight to the economy of the house. So do you know, not only is he speaking to Pharaoh on a personal level, he is managing all Pharaoh's affairs. He is giving oversight to the economy of the house, management of personal wealth and riches. Now, because, because Joseph interpreted dreams, he gained the favor, and he now was reaching Pharaoh on a personal level to the point of where Everything that was under the control of Pharaoh in the context of his own house, Pharaoh's house. Let's leave Egypt aside. Pharaoh's house. Joseph had influence over it. He had influence over the management of his personal wealth, over his relationships in his house, with his, obviously with his, with, his, uh, with his children and with his wife. That's why Joseph was able to marry Pharaoh's daughter. He had so much of influence over there. Now, if you are bound just to household thinking, what are you managing? You're just managing some domestic affairs in the household, people that are depressed, people that are in debt, people that are distressed, and by the time you finish, you are more depressed than them. Because you face that every week. Amen? Amen? But when you're beginning to engage people as a son of the kingdom, 
I believe that you can manage their wealth. You will manage their lives personally. Because you have something of a superior nature. And God can give you superior wisdom. To have such influence that you can be Lord over their house. Amen. Third thing is, third thing is, he has made me ruler over the land. So firstly, he made me a father to Pharaoh. Secondly, he made me Lord over his house. Thirdly, he made me ruler over the land. And we heard so much about rulership, dominion, governing, reign, all of the words that have been used. And uh, what Tamo mentioned is that to rule is to rule over, over a specific space. And when it says here, ruler over the land, it simply means to have rule or dominion, and it means to govern a jurisdiction. And yeah, Joseph was now made ruler where he was governing the jurisdiction of Egypt. So anyone that came within that jurisdiction would come under his rulership, would come under his territorial influence with power and authority. So, when he made this transition and he came, he came into such influence and power, he started to have influence over Pharaoh, over Pharaoh's household, over the jurisdiction in terms of the land. He had such great influence. And yes, he was the son of Jacob. But do you know when he reconnected with his father, he did not forget He did not forget to honor his father. Now, the, here's, here's the thing. When you make such transitions where, as sons of the household, you come into such powers of influence, where you can manage the affairs of others personally, and you have such jurisdiction over their lives, the principle of honor can be removed from your life. Because you forget where you came from. And you forget who trained you, and who influenced you, and who imparted to you. Amen? What maintained Joseph's, Joseph's authority even continually after that was that he, when he heard that his fathers and brothers, etc., were in trouble, he used the influence that he gained in the world to make sure that he took care of them. Amen? I'm skipping all the scriptures because of time. Right? So, in case you don't think it's in the Bible, just go and read Genesis 45. Let me read it just, just for the sake of record. In Genesis 45 verse 9, Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. Now, while he was in Egypt, Joseph had two biological sons. And uh, the, their names were Manasseh and Ephraim, as you know. And the sons were born to him in Egypt. So, in Genesis 45, 46 to, to 27, 46, 27, tells you the whole family of Jacob came to Egypt, and in total, there were 70. Now, when you look at this 70, the initial 70 that Jesus sent out, the initial 70 that Jesus sent out, and this is in Luke 10, verse 1 to 2. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others. Also, he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers. These 70 that were sent out, as you all know, they were sent to the house of Israel. All agree? Okay? They were sent to the, to the house of Israel. The 70... That, that were sent out. And these sons, while these sons that come with Jacob, they come into Egypt, 
while they are within the system of Egypt, they become part of a holy nation. They form part of a, of a holy nation. This holy nation later comes out of Egypt. Is that right? So while you are in the systems of this world as a son of the kingdom, how many of you know that the people that you are meeting is to eventually make them part of the holy nation and to bring them out? Not for them to stay there. Okay? Now, let me give you another example in the form of David. My time is running. David was also a son in the household of Jesse. And while he was in his father's house, he tended his father's sheep. He fought the lion and the bear. He was despised by his brothers, as you know, after he was anointed. He was a skilled musician. He was prudent in speech. He was a man of great valor. All his, his CV is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And as you read about, about David, you will see that while he was in the house of his father, he was a powerful, powerful entity within the house of his father. He was, so, he was so submissive that he was not even there for his own ordination service. <laughs> Simply because he was taking care of his fathership. He was an absolutely submissive son. And uh, faithful to his father's house. And he fought the lion and the bear. And how many of you know the lion and the bear are territorial animals? They maintain territory. So do you know in households, you, you can just be fighting territories or maintaining territories or trying to just take hold of one territory and believe that this is your territory. So he's fighting territorialism. Now when he, when he became, when he was anointed by Samuel, and uh, after he was anointed by Samuel, you'll find that certain things change. He's not playing music in his own house now. He's playing the harp for Saul. Shift. Amen? He's playing the harp for Saul. He carried bread and wine for the house of Saul. He dealt with Goliath. He faced enemies of the kingdom and not of the household. Goliath is an enemy of the kingdom. It is not an enemy of the household. Amen? He's starting to deal with different, different kinds of enemies. He had to hear the voice of God clearly to deal with the situation. He had to learn how to survive in caves and wildernesses. He had to learn how to deliver other cities. But most importantly, he had to deal with his heart. Now, when he became king of Israel, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2, the Bible will say, also in time past when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Now, when he was now placed as king over the nation of Israel, and he's now fathering the nation of Israel. How many of you know he was able to rule in the midst of all the enemies, which are listed in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 to 14? I'm going to skip all of that. Okay. How do we, how do we begin to structure our households so that you can clearly identify that there are sons within your household that are being constrained. And you've got to know that it is so easy for them to just be trophies and not be arrows that are launched from a bow, sent into different dimensions. And yes, every week I know we pronounce the benediction. It's a powerful, powerful thing to do because you are commissioning the people to go out and express the kingdom of God. Amen? But you must be able to allow them to go and manifest the grace of Father in the world. Amen? And this 30th school is about allowing this world to taste this wine. <laughs> Tell you why. You know in, in uh, John chapter 2 there are six water pots. They are filled with water. The six is the number of man. 
They are actually stone, stone jars, which are symbol of sons of God, that are filled with water. And what is the capacity? The capacity is 30 gallons. It's a symbol of maturity. But there has to come a time where everyone can taste the wine. And this wine is not an inferior wine. It is a superior wine. It is a royal wine. So, when a, when a pioneer, when, when an apostle of Tamil stature comes to the conclusion that schools of this nature has to be closed, there is definitely a shift. There is definitely significant shifts. And these shifts have to take place practically even within your household. I believe there's going to be more sending than you've ever seen before because of the maturity of the sons of God that will plant and invade all spheres of life. They will begin to grow up and function in all the things that they have learned for all of these years. Amen? And many, many of us have been faithful sons. And let me say to you, your inheritance is awaiting you. Something tremendous is going to begin to, to happen in your, in your life. Because you're not just going to go from conference to conference, you're actually going to go into the world. <laughs> Say amen. You're actually going to speak to someone that knows nothing about the kingdom of God. You're actually going to express something that everyone around you is waiting to hear. So much that you have received that people out there are ready to, are ready to receive something new. Now, you see, this gospel is so easy. I'll tell you why. It's called the gospel of good news. Everyone say good news. You see, when Joseph is in it, when, when Pharaoh is in trouble because of famine, you can bring good news. Because there are solutions you can bring. Even when Nebuchadnezzar was having dreams that were tormenting him, Daniel brought some good news. That even though the stump is cut down, it will grow again at some point. Naaman received good news when he was told to go and there's a man who could heal him and he went and, and dipped himself seven times in the river Jordan. And we can go on talking about those that, are, that have received good news. Now, in my last couple of minutes, I want to draw a contrast between, and I gave you some of them, between the sons of the household and the sons of the kingdom. Is that okay? The sons of the household, they tithe. <laughs> Say amen. And tithing is an important part. We all have to tithe. But sons of the kingdom, they sacrifice. There's a difference. Sons of the kingdom tithe. And uh, it becomes a law, it becomes something, you know, that we become confined to. But when you begin to see your finances beyond the law, and you start to see it from the dimension of grace, you will understand that you are blessed to be a distributor. Okay, this has been covered in many of the schools. I'm not, I'm not going to highlight them. I'm just throwing out some stuff. So, sons of the kingdom, when it comes to finances, they don't just tithe, they sacrifice. They know how to carry the burden. They know how to be the sacrifice. They know how to jump on the altar and say, kill me. Sons of the household are faithful to the house. But sons of the kingdom are faithful to the body. Amen? They don't believe that their household is the body. They are faithful to the body of Christ. And it is so important for all of us to begin to, to train our people within our household to begin to be a blessing to the body of Christ. From the very time we pioneered our local church, I always maintained that mentality. That we were to be a blessing to the body of Christ. Whenever I would go to speak in other churches, I would always ask the pastor, can I bring a few more people? And we would take our whole church to go. And we would go and be a blessing to them. Actually, sometimes prepare an offering for the pastor that I was going to preach for. Why? Because we were beyond thinking of the house. We wanted to think more about the body. We, our heart was to be a blessing to the body, to be a blessing to the body of Christ. 
The sons of the household elevate the spiritual father of the household. But sons of the kingdom elevate the heavenly father within the spiritual father. Amen? There's an elevation of God the father. Sometimes as sons of, the, of a spiritual father, you can elevate your spiritual father to the point of worship. But as, as sons of the kingdom, you elevate the heavenly father. Sons of the household seek brothers in the house. But sons of the kingdom seek partnerships in the kingdom of God. There's a difference. There's a difference. You seek partnerships in the, in the kingdom of God. You see how you can work with other networks, other churches, uh, continually. Dr. Segi, even within our own city, is always seeking out that. And I can tell you from my own experience that everything that he is talking about, we practically experience in terms of seeking out relationships, working with other, with other networks, working with other people in the body of Christ, uh, which is just beyond thinking of the household. Sons of the household resource the house, but sons of the kingdom, they resource the body of Christ. Sons of the household build the local household, but sons of the kingdom build the city. Amen? They build a city. Sons of the household are household focused, but sons of the kingdom are nation focused. Focused on how we can get into nation. Sons of the household, listen to this, their vision is streamlined. But sons of the kingdom, their vision is peripheral. Streamlined means you only see this way. But peripheral means you see all around. Are you with me? And if you only look in a certain direction, you'll be missing what's all around you. So many things that are around you. Sons of the household function from the gift. So for instance, if you've got a household where your father is prophetic, his nature, his, his, his mantle is mainly prophetic as a gift of the body, maybe he functions as a prophet, you will find that those within the household will function within the dimension only of that prophetic gift. So do you know every time you have to lean to the gift? So if you and I have a powerful meeting, you've got to call someone, prophesy over them, then the meeting will be powerful. Because it's the gift. But sons of the kingdom function from Christ. They don't function from the gift. They realize that there's, there's something more than that. Sons of the household understand rank in the house. But sons of the kingdom, they are able to recognize rank in the kingdom. And partake of it. Recognize it. Sow into it. Access it. Know how to, to get something that is greater and beyond even the local house. Sons of the household attend household meetings. But sons of the kingdom are interested in city meetings. Sons of the household attend spiritual conferences. Sons of the kingdom attend governmental and corporate conferences. Hello? That's a, that's a hard one to swallow. Uh, when last have you attended a conference that's not saying anything spiritual? Hmm? But as you sit there, you learn something. Everyone's with me? Okay. Because if you, if you attend governmental corporate conferences, there are things that push you beyond just thinking like a church maniac. Everyone's, everyone's getting the picture. Don't get upset. Please come to all the conferences. Okay? But do you know, am, am, I, am I helping you to understand how you, how, how you can be confined in your thinking? And uh, for, for what I know is a shift. We have to think beyond that. And we have to begin to equip beyond that. And we have to begin to train beyond that. Because there's a definite movement to seeing the kingdom of God as we are seeing being detailed and defined for us. As we are beginning to, to see the rule of God being manifest in our own lives. Our influence is going to tremendously increase 
beyond the boundaries of your church. Your church can't be built like a cathedral. It has to be structured in a way where your influence in the community is going to be so great, tremendously great, that, uh, that they will definitely know the Ark of the Covenant is there. They won't miss it. Amen? I have a few minutes, and I don't want to get into anything else, but I would like us to pray. Let me stand up for a, not a prayer meeting, this is not a warfare meeting. But I want to pray and just impart something. Is that okay? I actually didn't come prepared to share this. As I sat there, I decided to share this with you. I want us to lift our hands to the Father. Let's just pray in the Spirit for a few moments. And I want us to begin to believe that something great is going to begin to shift. Pray for your sons. Pray that something tremendously will shift in their minds. Their spirit would receive capacity to begin to express the kingdom of God in a new and a fresh way. Father, we thank you. We have been faithful to listen to your word. We have been faithful to let the rain of heaven fall like dew upon us. We have been faithful to let the teachings of God come and be deposited upon us for all of this time that we have gathered. But today we begin to see a new shift coming into our households, into our spheres of influence, into our spiritual families. I thank you for dynamics of the kingdom that are going to be unlocked, that that kingdom that is within is going to be released Lord, through words, through impartations, through gifts, I declare in the Spirit, Lord, an impact that's beginning to take place in every region. Lord, as people are representing different nations, different suburbs, different parts of South Africa and other parts of this continent, we declare, Lord, an impartational grace that is beginning to shift them into new dynamics. I thank you that a new capacity to hear the Word of God in a new way, a measure that is coming to see things beyond, our, the, beyond the way we see it right now. We thank you, Lord, that we are seeing people rise up in the name of Jesus. We begin to call forth the sons of God. We thank you that they are sons of the kingdom. Their rule and reign is beginning to influence all spheres of society. They are beginning to rule over domains. They are beginning to rule all over the regions that they have set their foot upon. We thank you, Lord, they will have personal encounters with kings. Lord, they will influence kings to manage their affairs. They will have influence over rulers of the land, over business people. We thank you that the words that they would speak would bring wisdom from the throne of God, that the throne of God would release, must, would release wisdom like never before. We thank you this mature company of people will not be afraid, but be bold enough to speak what you are saying and what you are demanding right now. The world is in crisis, but the church is not in crisis because there's a true church rising up, a church that is filled with the seven spirits of God, a church that is standing on Mount Zion, a governmental church, a church that is holy and righteous and pure before you, a church of integrity, a church of overcomers. Let this church begin to have influence in every nation. We call for this company of people. Let them arise by the power of the Holy Ghost. We see them, Lord, having dominion in every region. We see them influencing new places. We see pioneers beginning to go into new regions. We see young people, another generation yet to be created, penetrating new spheres and influence. Creators, inventors, Lord, dimensions of things never seen before. This company is coming out coming out in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. Well, this is the, this is the season for the body to arise. I think when we go back, I don't, it's not I think, I know when we go back from here, you're going to literally see how people are going to be drawn to you, to your people. Doors are going to open. Inquiries are going to be made. There's a visibilization that will take place. You know, we've said this six years ago that the season is going viral. It's going visible. But now we have to enter into that literal manifestation. And, and it's going to happen with the body. 
with the body corporate. Some, some of us will be sitting and watching as God will be taking the sons that have been sitting for years and, and, um, and see these sons step into their corporate destiny. What a day to be alive. And thank you that it takes a son of Dr. Segi, who is a father in his own right, to announce this message to us, that it's, it's the sons that are going to arise now. And you know what creation is waiting for? The manifestation of the sons of God. That's what creation is waiting for. So what a day. What a day. And so make the shifts, because the day of having a neighborhood mentality is over. Uh, the village mentality is over. The, uh, the, the vegetable garden mentality is over. All right? Now we're going to farm the fields and the mountains and the hills. So go from here with a sense of feeling that we are transitioning from household to kingdom business, to kingdom business. So may the Lord bless you as you go. Come back in the evening.